Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the November meeting of Durham County Council's County Planning Committee. My name is John Robinson. I represent the Setchfield and Fishburne Division, and I chair the County Planning Committee. Um, as I say, welcome. Can we welcome the members of the Durham County Council Authority who are going to participate? To the members of the public who are participating either in support or against the applications, thank you for showing interest. To the officers from across the county, from all the different departments that are here, thank you very much for attending. And finally, to the members of the public and press who are observing this meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, this meeting is being broadcast live to YouTube onto the County Council's YouTube site and will be available for at least six months for public viewing. May I ask either members, officers or members of the public who intend speaking to introduce yourselves for the first time you speak. After then, there's no need to introduce yourselves. Please, throughout the meeting, will all members and members of the public who are about to participate put your microphones on mute until the chairman asks you to speak. If in the case of my own system going down, Councillor Mr Ivan June has, Jewel has kindly agreed to step in as the vice chairman is not present. So he will take over until I, mine is resumed. If members of the council wish to speak, if you would use the chat line, that would be grateful. And as always, it's RTS request to speak. May I also advise members of the public and of also the, the councillors that if you put something or can't type in the chat line, people can read it. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're at begin with and I turn over to item one. Apologies, Ian. Yes, Chair, we have apologies from councillors Hawley, Tinsley, Corrigan, Shield and Kay. Thank you. Sir, could you give us any substitute members? Yes, Chair, we have Councillor Pounder substituting for Councillor Corrigan, Councillor Linda Marshall substituting for Councillor Kay, and Councillor Kellett substituting for Councillor Tinsley. Thank you. Declarations of interest. I have been advised this morning by the legal department that as I am, was the Mayor of Setchfield Borough, when one of the speakers was also a local mayor, that I should declare an interest on the second part, i.e. item B. So what will happen, Councillor Ivan Jules kindly agreed this morning to take over for that part. Unless I get a different answer from our legal department, I will go mute, I will go off camera and take no part whatsoever, and then we'll rejoin the meeting to finish at item six. So item four, five B, thank you very much to Councillor Mr Jules. So could we first now move on to the minutes of the 2nd of September? Can we agree them? I'm getting nods of agreement. Thank you very much. Agreed, so move I, thank you. We now move on to, thank you, Ivan, to item five, applications to be determined. The first one is Enterprise Point, Enterprise City, Green Lane. And please, may I introduce Chris Shields, who is the case officer. Good morning, Chris, and members and the public are over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Okay, this application is for a change of use to clinical waste treatment and transfer facility, including autoclave, air condenser, boiler, shredder, compaction units, bin washers, and extraction flues at Enterprise Point One, Enterprise City, Greenland Industrial Estate, Spennymoor. The application site is highlighted in red. Uh, the site's access from Meadowfield Avenue to the uh, immediate west of the, the red line which reaches the A167 via York Hill Road to the north. The site was formerly occupied by Boots and used as a distribution hub by them. The applicant currently occupies the adjoining unit to the north, immediately adjoining unit, where they operate their business of distribution and collection of clinical waste bins. In their current site, the waste is bulked up for treatment or disposal elsewhere. The clinical waste bins are washed and stored for reuse. The proposed development would involve the collection of the same waste, but the additional space within the application site would allow for the inclusion of a treatment process for some waste streams using an autoclave, which is essentially a pressure cooker, which would sterilise the waste before it is recycled 
or disposed of elsewhere. The additional space would also allow for more storage of empty clinical waste containers for wider distribution and to maintain a ready supply. So the, the aerial photograph here shows a relationship of the proposed site to other industrial development in the, the north of Spennymoor there, and also the proximity to the new residential development in the southwest. And this photograph shows the uh, existing bin storage in their current site. Um, you might have seen these type of bins in medical facilities, doctors, hospitals, etc. Uh, and this photograph shows the, the existing process of, of washing and emptying the bins. In the foreground, you can see a, a large bin, which is double lined with plastic, um, ready to be put into their the wash plant. And you can see one of the smaller yellow bins being emptied into the larger container, and then it goes on an automated washing process. This um, plant will be moved to the, the new uh, site. It's difficult to see on this slide, but this is a proposed layout. It would maintain the existing loading dock to the, the south. Um, and you can see there there'd be a, that would be physically separated from the, the rest of the building, which would maintain an open plan layout. The wash plant would be on the, the eastern side of the building and then the, the shredder, autoclave and compaction units on the, um, the western side. And there'd be storage for the, the bins and, and pallets within the rest of the building. Uh, this is a view of the, um, the entrance from Meadowfield Avenue. The photo shows when the, the site was used as a distribution centre. You can see to the, the right hand side of the picture the, the car park, and it's obviously full of a lot of vehicles there. Um, this proposal would reduce the number of vehicle movements and put a cap on it of 46 movements per day, which is likely to be a lot less than what it was when it was an unrestricted um, distribution centre. So we've had no objections received from statutory internal and inter external consultees. There has been significant local objection with 134 neighbour letters, letter from local member Councillor Grayson and also Spennymoor Town Council member Councillor Harmer. The majority of the objections relate to noise, odour, air quality highways, harm to health, disturbance for the users and um, nearly all of them, the impact to house prices. The degree of concern has likely been caused simply by a description of development, clinical waste treatment and transfer facility. This sounds like the development has potentially be far more pleasant than it actually is. And as set out in the applicant's statement, the adjoining unit has been used for clinical waste transfer for more than 15 years. And it's the same type of waste that they, they've been doing for that time. So in conclusion, the development's mainly the re relocation of a long established business from an adjoining unit, but with the addition of a treatment process for a waste stream that's already collected at the adjoining site. The applicant has demonstrated through the operation of the existing site that environmental impacts of clinical waste management can be controlled in this, in this location. Concerns of objectives have been taken into consideration and conditions recommended where necessary to ensure the development does not cause harm. The development is considered to be fully compliant with all relevant local and national planning policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Chris, for clarity, the town councillor, Councillor Harmer, was he speaking on behalf of himself or on behalf of the town council? Because the town council haven't registered to speak. Uh, no, he's confirmed that he's only speaking as an individual councillor. Thank you very much. So at this moment in time, we have no town or parish council reps or no local members. So therefore, we'll go straight over to, now I'm not sure who's going to speak, whether you're both going to speak, gentlemen or not, but to Mr. Michael Feeman or Mr. Adam Feeman. Good morning, gentlemen. I understand you're brothers. Uh, good, morning, yeah, good morning, chat. Good morning, chat. Which of the brother wants to speak or do you both? Because if it's both of you, then it's two and a half minutes each. If it's only one of you, it's five minutes, sir. I think it's going to be myself, Michael. Okay, good morning, sir. The gentleman I keep calling Ian I, I, is Mr. Croft. Mr. Croft is from the committee sector section. Mr. Croft will give you a one minute warning, so at least you know that when to start uh, summing up. But well, everybody's over to you, sir, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, committee, for allowing me to speak today. 
Um, before I go into the, ob the objection, I would like to say thank you to the, the plan officer and the environmental health officer who spent a lot of time speaking to both myself and my brother regarding this objection. Um, I'd also like to thank the applicant. I, I do understand that obviously if the uh, proposal is agreed, they have agreed conditions to be put on the application, which has eased some of our concerns. Um, our objection is based around the noise report. We don't believe that the noise report is being undertaken on a worst case scenario, as was requested by the environmental health officer at the council. To give some context to the BS4142 noise report, which was requested, um, a noise consultant visits the area. He undertakes some, uh, obtains some existing noise measurements in, in the area where the, the properties are. They then model uh, the, the plant, which is going to be going into the unit, uh, which then shows a comparison of what the, the noise levels of the plant's going to be in comparison to the existing noise levels there at the minute. The noise consultant can then add subjective penalties onto the assessment if they believe certain noises will be heard at the nearest residential property. These noises can be impulsive, uh, tonal, intermittent, and other sound characteristics which may be distinctive against the residual acoustic environment. The conclusion of the noise report can be one of three things. Any noise up to five decibels above the background level shows that there should be no impact from the development, which is the case here. The noise report has concluded that there should be only up to three decibels above the background level. Noise levels five to nine decibels above the background level would show that the development might have an adverse impact to the nearest residential properties. And noise levels 10 decibels or above would show that the development may cause a significant adverse impact. Our, our concerns, like I said before, uh, that we don't believe that the report's been undertaken on the worst case scenario as was requested by the council. The noise levels used within the report show that the shredder will operate at 102 decibels and the autoclave will be at 96 decibels. These noise levels were obtained following the noise consultant undertaking a visit to a different site in the country and obtaining them noise levels from a similar plant which they've got there. Uh, we requested that these noise measurements be made available to, to scrutinize. Uh, we wanted to know whether the measurements took one meter away from the plant or whether they took 100 meters away from the plant. That, that hasn't been clear. We also want to know was the plant, when the noise measurements were took, was it operating on a full load or half load? And were the machines running on a full speed or half speed? Um, all, all them different factors were, would influence the, the noise levels which were obtained from the, the consultant. Uh, the next point is we acknowledge that some penalties have been applied for tonality for the extraction system, which the consultant says will be just perceivable at the nearest residential properties. And some penalties on the assessment have been applied for impulsive noises, for door slams and skip movements, which will again would just be perceivable at the nearest residential properties. However, I believe the 4142 assessment should also have additional penalties applied to it for the noise characteristics of when the shredder is actually shredding material, as in my opinion, uh, noise levels of 102 decibels shredding uh, will be audible at the nearest residential properties. And again, as the report was requested on the worst case scenario, I feel these additional penalties should have been taken into account. Uh, the, the, next, the next point is on Sunday, the 1st of November, it was witnessed that the, the unit had the roller door shutters open uh, most of the day when HGV movements were in the yard. And I have no doubt this continued throughout the lifetime of the development. The noise report did not take into account noise escaping from the building when any roller shutter doors may be open. This therefore doesn't allow us to, to have a, a full picture of the unit of what the noise levels will be at the nearest residential properties when doors will be open. A again, not taking a worst case scenario account of the report. One minute only... remaining. Okay, thank you. And finally, the, the last point is the background noise levels um, which we use as part of the assessment were not the lowest recorded background levels and again demonstrate not a worst case scenario. I accept that the report has been done in the 4142 methodology. BS 4142 does state that the lowest background measurement doesn't have to be used. I get that. That is correct. However, as the council have requested a worst case scenario report, in my opinion, the, the lowest background level should have been used as part of this assessment. And if that was done, that would have took the assessment from being three decibels above the background level, showing no impact, to being seven decibels above the background level, which would cause, which is likely to cause an adverse impact. So I think that the difference in them decibel levels, I think doors, the assessment with the doors shut, not open. And I think the lack of penalties on the application, 
if we were looking at a worst case scenario, would increase it from being currently um, from being currently acceptable to being then unacceptable. And that's all the comments I've got to make. Thank you for your time. No, I, hope, thank you. I hope that made sense. If anyone has any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman, and thank you to your brother for joining you. Chris, clearly that was a folk question or presentation focused on noise. Do we have somebody who is going to respond to that, or is that going to be the applicant? Uh, unfortunately, John Hayes, the environmental health officer, wasn't able to be here today. He's been on leave. Um, but to, to sort of answer the question up front, I suppose, um, John did ask for the worst case scenario, as Mr. Feynman set out. The study we received, I uh, forward that on to John. John was happy with the outcome of that, and he recommended conditions. Um, and in particular, I direct members to condition four, which sets specific noise levels for the site and allows us to, um, well, asks them to monitor it, but it doesn't preclude us from doing our own monitoring of the site as well. So essentially, their top level limits, um, there isn't any degree of freedom within that, and we'd expect the the applicant to be able to, to reach that, and the applicant has indeed agreed that they can achieve those noise limits. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chris. And all the other comments by objectors in regards to the uh, uh, covered, uh, you know, those who aren't here, you've covered in the report. Yes. So can we now move over to Mr. Carl Sheehan from Sharp Smart Limited? Good morning, Mr. Sheehan. You've Good got morning. exactly the same as Mr. Freeman. Five minutes, one minute back prior to you finishing. Mr. Croft will give you the one minute warning. So over to you, Mr. Sheehan. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak in front of the committee today and the members of the public. My name is Carl Sheehan. I'm the uh, technical manager for Sharp Smart. So I cover uh, compliance, new infrastructure, pro project management, uh, that side of the business. So at Sharp Smart, our core business is the manufacture, supply and servicing of reusable Sharps containers, which you may have seen uh, in the local healthcare facilities. So our aim is to make healthcare safer through our safety engineered container. So our containers are safer, more environmentally friendly alternative to the use of virgin plastic single use containers, which are burnt after one single use. Our Sharp Smart containers can be used up to 500 times, saving thousands of tons of plastic, reducing CO2 emissions by over 80% over the life of the container. We've been supplying the NHS with reusable containers and healthcare waste services for close to 20 years from our headquarters at Unit 44, Meadowfield Avenue, and since Ju July 2019 in Unit 1, which we've used for uh, distribution and storage of our containers. We've been servicing hospitals such as Newcastle RVI, Sunderland, James Cook and other major NHS trusts in the region. In our history nationally, we've had no health and safety or environmental issues. We run four further regional facilities in Yorkshire, Staffordshire, Essex and Berkshire. To support the local NHS and the healthcare sector in the northeast, Sharp Smart are looking to invest in our Sharp Smart uh, many more facilities, sorry, with new equipment and technologies for the safe processing of certain healthcare wastes. This sustainable process allows waste to be rendered non-hazardous by the means of steam treatment. The resultant material is then used as an alternative to fossil fuels in power stations and cement kilns. There are currently no facilities in the region permitted to do this, which results in the waste from the local hospital being transported hundreds of miles for processing and disposal at an additional cost to the local NHS. To invest, the investment in Unit 1 will create long-term jobs for the region. We currently employ 21 staff from the local area in the current facility. Um, some of those have been with us since the beginning. We have five current new open roles. The Spennymore facility is Sharp Smart's HQ, National HQ, and we are employing roles such as drivers and plant operative site managers the site is also home to our national customer service teams, HR department, national operation leads, uh, and we're looking to grow uh, the administration side of the business further out of this facility due to the larger space we now have. A healthcare waste treatment facility that we're proposing is not what people might envisage of a waste disposal site. The waste arrives in sealed waste containers, which are then in locked waste carts. The carts are stored within the building, waiting process. 
Typically, waste will be processed within 24 hours of arriving on site and then removed for onward recovery at the energy to waste facilities or power plants. Large quantities of waste will not be stored. There will be no loose piles and material anywhere on site. All waste would be continued to be stored in the sealed carts until processed. The equipment and process undergoes in-depth testing to meet high standards set and controlled by the Environment Agency. These standards are checked weekly during the first six months of operations and then monthly for the life of the plant to ensure high standards are, are maintained. Sharp Smart would be willing to have open days to show the local community how this operation works. We want to have a working relationship with the local area to discuss any concerns. We believe we've taken note of the concerns raised to date and we, we have offered solutions to address as stated out in the conditions we have agreed to take. One minute. Such as, thank you. Such as the removal of the gate alarms, reversing alarms and a traffic management system to ensure no sharp smart vehicles uh, access the, the site from the, the residential side. Um, that is all uh, I was going to say. I would like to just while well, I've got a minute left to speak about the noise side of it, I am not qualified to discuss in depth the, the noise report. Um, but in terms of discussing doors open, doors closed, and stuff like that, once the site is a permitted operational facility, as we're hoping it would be, um, there are requirements for the doors to be shut during operation. And hopefully, as you saw from the, the site plan that was showed in the early presentation, the, the loading dock, which we would use for the movement of the, the materials, is enclosed and almost a separate unit to where the, the waste processing will take place. So there is an extra internal wall between the processing plants and the what will be open doors during the unloading and loading. So hopefully that Time will... Time has elapsed, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Mr. Sheehan. So we've had now our presentations. Mr. Shields, Chris, would you like to, to sum up? Is there anything you wish to say? Uh, no, Chair, I think uh, everything's been covered. If there's any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Councillor Mr. Clare. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a, a question of the applicant, if that is possible, please. Of course it is. Um, I'm sorry, sir, I missed your name, um, but uh, thank you for that um, very clear um, uh, account. Um, I'd just like to, um, uh, and, and I was um, to a degree, um, uh, satisfied with your explanation of the safety of of the of, of the operation and particularly when you talked about the fact that you're going to be um uh, having the environmental agency coming in every month to make sure everything's fine that that that, that was a, a great relief i would however like to quiz you on um just two things relating to paragraphs 13 to 14. um the first one is where it says that um, a small volume of liquid effluent is produced, 600 litres per cycle. Um, I'm, I'm interested to know how many cycles a day um, you would envisage this plant doing. And then we need to times that by 600 to find the um, the total amount of liquid. And so uh, the part of this first question is, um, is that the, does this total up to 1.2 million litres a year? Is that where the 1.2 million litres <laughs> comes from? And the second thing um, relates to that 1.2 million litres, where it says in paragraph 14, any potentially contaminated effluent, and you must understand uh, the alarm that you, uh, so anybody reading that, those words uh, feels, and this is going to be discharged to sewer. Um, so um, uh, my second and main question actually is, um, I need reassurances uh, um, that um, this potentially contaminated effluent <coughs> won't be causing any dangers at any point or anywhere 
um, or any smell as well. Uh, sort of, um, I, I, I witter on and people are very patient with me. So my, my, my first question relates to the volume of uh, liquid effluent which is being produced and the second one to its safety. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, John. Mr Sheen, would you like to answer them questions? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Yes. So in terms of contaminated effluent, it, it potentially sounds worse than it actually is. In essence, it's condensed steam. It's classed as effluent because it's gone through a treatment process um, and contaminated because it has become in contact with a waste stream, even though that waste stream has now been rendered non-hazardous. In essence, it is water. It is condensed steam. Um, again, the, the effluent is tested on a regular basis as part of our discharge consent. Um, we have a discharge consent currently at our unit 44 that discharges our wash waters. It is no different than that. It, in essence, is condensed steam from a wash process. So the, it is non-hazardous and that isn't a problem. Um, and it is regularly done throughout the country in very similar facilities. In terms of volume, uh, the 600 litres is the higher estimate. Uh, you get more effluent dependent on ambient conditions. So if it's a cold day, obviously the, the chamber that we use to uh, process the waste would be cold. So you have to use more steam and you get a bit more effluent. So 600 is, is the maximum. As it goes through the day and the process is warmed up, that gets less and less to maybe around the 300 litres per cycle mark. Um, on a normal processing day, we do about 10 cycles. Um, and then, yes, it's around 10 cycles a day, at 600 at most. Uh, hopefully that's answered your question. Thank you very much, John. I have Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Atkinson, Jim, at the moment we're only doing clarifications. We haven't opened for debate. Is this a clarification question? Well, I could ask, it's a technical question for Carl. I can ask it later, I can ask it now. No, no, no. If it's a technical question, please go on. Thank you, Jim. Uh, yes. Um, uh, my name is Councillor Jim Atkinson from Aircliffe East. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. We can, yes. Good morning. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm on page 41 of the proposal, item 11. And from there, I'm reading out the, the autoclave would be a horizontally orientated cylindrical vessel that was, would be subject to high vacuum and high pressure. And it goes on and then later on the pressure, there's a vacuum and then there's a pressure steam is injected into it. I used to work with high pressure um, vessels. I used to build them. So w when we're talking about high pressure, we can be talking about like hundreds of pounds per square inch, or we can be talking about thousands of pounds per square inch. And the problems that we have is, is relative to leakages and possible ex explosions relative to, you know, how big the volume is. So th there's a potential hazard there. Uh, and, and all of the vessels I, I, I we used to build, you had to get uh, especially inspected by insurance companies and things like that. Can we just make sure that everything is cleared by insurance companies and that if you can give us some idea what the pressures are, we can we can worry about it or not worry about it so much. Yeah, OK. Uh, good morning, Councillor. Uh, the pressure at the, the highest point of the treatment is 45 PSI. Oh, is that all? Hey, that's all. It, it, we call it high pressure in terms of clinical waste treatment because some of the treatments don't use any pressure. They use pressurised steam as an injector, but don't hold it at pressure. So this is a pressurised vessel, but it goes to 45 PSI. So it isn't huge, huge pressures. Uh, and yes, we are still uh, under the, the insurance requirements. So every year our vessels are NDT tested pressure tested and signed off by insurance, uh, as well as our boilers. Thank you very much. We've got no more members requesting technical questions, so can we go straight into the debate? Does any member wish to comment? No, therefore, can I have, a, if nobody wishes to comment, could I ask for if anybody wishes to make a proposal? I can uh, propose that we accept the officer's recommendations. Thank you very much, Councillor Jim Atkinson. Councillor John, John Clare. 
we, we get a lot of these um, proposals. Um, ultimately, it depends the, the it depends on the promises of the applicant that they are maintained. And uh, sometimes we get applicants making promises which turn out in the end not to be upheld. And that's where the problems arrive. Um, that was why, and I mentioned it when I was speaking, um, this is going to be um, subject to the environment. The processes are going to be subject to regular testing by the Environment Agency. And that um, alleviated my fears in that respect. Um, and uh, what strikes me as well is that in terms of noise and the number of uh, journeys generated and that, um, residents will have um, recourse to um, uh, planning enforcement at Durham County Council um, and um, they'll be able to challenge any misuse of the system um, in that respect. Uh, consequently, um, the applicants have to understand that people worry about this and I was very heartened to hear that they're going to be showing people around and hopefully uh, setting their minds at rest. Um, but um, I think we've heard enough, Chair, um, to come to the conclusion that at least um, given the promises of the applicant, we can um, uh, accept this um, application and I'll second Councillor Atkinson's uh, proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Atkinson, Councillor Clare. So, Councillor Mr Jill, Ivan. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'd just like to add to that, that I, I feel that there are quite stringent conditions associated with this application, and I think this probably mitigate, mitigates any of the fears that, um, that re local residents have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We now move over to, to our solicitor, uh, to Claire, Claire, Claire Croft. Um, for our members of the public, the voting system, of course, it's virtual, is run by the council solicitor, and she will take us all through the process and explain what we're about to do. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Chair. Yes, my name's Claire Cuskin from the legal department. I'm just about to take an alphabetical vote of members who are present. Um, so the proposal is as set out in the report. Can I just check whether each member as I go through is for or against the proposal, please, starting with Councillor Atkinson? In favour. Thank you. Councillor Bell? For the proposal. Thank you. Councillor Clare? Approved. Thank you. Councillor Jewell? For. Thank you. Councillor Kellett? For. Councillor Ling? Approved. Thank you. Councillor Marshall? Four. Thank you. Councillor Pounder? Four. Thank you. Councillor Richardson? Four. Thank you. Councillor Shuttleworth? Four. Thank you. Councillor Simpson? Four. Thank you. Councillor Wilson? Four. Thank you. Unless I've missed anyone or, or you wish to vote chair, I make that um, unanimous. Thank you very much. So that's been passed unanimously. To Mr Freeman, Mr Freeman and Mr Sheehan, thank you very much. We now move on to item uh, 5B. As I said earlier, I've been advised this morning to declare an interest, which I will. Councillor Mr Jewell, thank you very much, sir, will now take over. And the presentation will be done by Mr Henry Jones. Over to you, Councillor Jones. Uh, Jewell, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Robinson. And um, this is the application for former Middlebur Milburn Gate House, Frommel Gate, uh, Waterside, Durham DH15TL. And it is pages 35 to 86 of your pack. Can I hand over for the presentation to uh, our officer, uh, Henry Jones? Over to you, Henry. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Can I just check, can anyone see that presentation yet? Because I brought it up as sharing, but it's not actually appeared. Yes. OK, great. Yes, so uh, this application, it's for, um, it actually involves three applications. It's a variation of condition of, of three conditions, one on, one on each of them at the Melbourne Gate House site. And it's so to extend the construction working hours of the site so that they will be permitted to work between the hours of 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Monday through to Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturdays 
and uh, those periods of extended working hours would uh, would cease on the 13th of May next year. Um, this is the site location plan. So I have identified each of the three application sites. So the, the red line relates to the entirety of the Milburn Gatehouse um, site. Um, and that's subject to one of the applications which covers uh, the entirety of, of the development. There's then uh, two other uh, sites uh, within that. That bound with the blue line is uh, predominantly a, a hotel uh, block development and that bound by the green line is predominantly an office block development. So there's three applications, but they all involve the same overall site. Um, the site itself was just a refresher is within Durham City Centre. Um, you can see um, Leeses Road and Milburn Gate Bridge just to the south of the, the site there. Uh, beyond that, we have the River Wart development and that includes, includes some student accommodation. Uh, to the side of that, there are residential flat, flats in the likes of uh, St Godric's and St Anne's Courts. Um, farther north and adjacent to Framelgate Peth, you have the Highgate residential development. And north of the application site, uh, the rather large building you can see there is a Radisson Blue Hotel. And to the left hand side of that, you've got residential properties at Sidegate and Diamond Terrace. On the opposite side of the river, you have um, the Freeman's Reach uh, development and beyond that, the Walker Gate and Freeman's Place uh, Leisure Centre. Here's just an aerial photograph just showing those sites in, in the context again. So you can see here that this aerial photograph, it does, does identify workings going on on the site, although it's a little bit out of date now. Uh, but you can see there how in the top right hand corner, of, uh, of the, the red bound area. You've got the welfare cabins of the site and you've got some earthworks being shown there. I've got some photographs there a little bit later on the presentation just to show uh, where the development is more latterly up to. So even though um, the we have to concentrate today only on the acceptability or otherwise of extended construction working hours, I thought it'd be helpful just to do a very brief overview of what the development is just to understand its context and just the nature and its scale again. Um, so planning permission was granted for the entirety of the site, um, partly in detail or full planning permission and partly in outline. So the detailed planning permission gave permission for six building blocks, which you can see are identified there, 1A through to, to 1F. Um, the northern part of the site, where you can see some white blocks, but they don't have any, any numbers or letters over them, they just have planning permission in outline. So there's no detailed information yet of exactly what those buildings would look like or their, their scale or layout, etc. And there'd be a, a requirement for a further application to come in to resolve that. Um, the development itself is a, is a major mixed use development. So Block 1A that you can see there principally comprises of a, of a hotel with some lower ground commercial floors. Uh, block 1E that you can see involves uh, predominantly an office block, again with some commercial units below. Uh, blocks 1F, 1C and 1B contain on the, on the ground floors a number of restaurants um, and those types of uses. Um, with some residential accommodation on upper floors and block 1D is predominantly a residential uh, block. In the outline phase further north, uh, we don't know the precise scope of, of that development yet, but it would comprise of a combination of, of housing and office ac um, accommodation. And this is just a visual representation of the development. So um this is looking from the opposite side of the river so the block on the the left hand side is the hotel block 1a uh, the rest of the, the the first phase blocks to the immediate right hand side and then over on the far kind of right corner the more gray blocks that's the outline phase that we don't really know the detail of at the moment so here's some photographs now these first ones are taken from the summer so they're a little bit out of date but um you can see here how the uh, podium to establish kind of the building level of the development has been implemented. And then you can see the uh, steel structure to the block 1A uh, building and then the block 1D building uh, behind. 
this is just another view from Melbourne Gate Bridge. Again, you can you can mainly just see the Block 1A building there and the podium works. And this is a view which is more recent. This was taken roughly a week ago. And this I thought it'd be useful just to take a kind of dusk view so to understand what the site looks and feels like of an evening. And you can see here there's actually um, some further first phase, phase uh, structural um, steel work gone up now um, and the site's more advanced. And the building you can just see on the in the foreground on the far right hand side is the Radisson Blue and the houses that you can see kind of behind the site, that's the Highgate development. In terms of uh, consultations and representations, um, the City of Durham Parish Council have objected. They're here to speak today, so they will uh, uh, explain in more detail what their concerns are, but principally they submitted comments that they've got concerns over the extended working hours given the proximity of residential properties. There's concerns over the justification of the site to uh, seek the, the extended hours, given that it continued throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. In terms of any of our required statutory and internal and external consultees, then the, the relevant ones are the Highway Authority in Environment, Health and Consumer Protection, neither raised objections. We've received 11 objections from neighbouring residents groups uh, and occupiers. Um, and comments include the un unacceptable impacts that the extended hours would bring, that the extended hours are again not justified and the contractor has continued on site throughout the pandemic. The site has already caused harmful amenity impacts in the past and that there's a lack of confidence that uh, future problems could be controlled via enforcement. Uh, Councillor Freeman also submitted comments just relaying some of the concerns that um, some residents in his his ward had raised and that he requested the application be heard at committee. So in terms of a summary of the key issues and conclusions, um, the principle of development is established and so that's not for, for, for debate today. The acceptability of the applications rest on whether the proposals to extend the constructed working hours of the site are acceptable or not. If they are found to not be acceptable, then what that would mean is that the existing planning permissions would, would simply continue and that the working hours that they're currently required to abide by uh, would simply subsist. Um, if approved, the extended working hours would be in place until the 13th of May next year. The requested hours are 7am to 8pm Monday to Friday, 8am to 6pm on a Saturday. And in summary, this represents a 30% increase across the working week overall, a commencement Monday through to Friday of, of 30 minutes earlier, a finish Monday through to Friday of two hours later, and a finish on a Saturday of five hours later. It is also proposed that uh, during the extended hours that certain operations cannot take place, those operations where they're more likely to cause uh, any troublesome noise or impacts. Um, there's a more detailed list in the suite of conditions, uh, which is in the report, um, but there's an example of some of those listed there. The thrust of a written ministerial uh, statement uh, and associated guidance on extending construction hours because of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic um, provides um, the key recent advice on these types of requests. And the thrust of that advice basically states that the councils can reject and refuse such requests, but in doing so, there should be very compelling reasons to do so. Um, the acceptability of the requested extended hours in this case is considered to be very finely balanced, and there are clearly sensitivities applicable to the site and the development. Um, given the proximity of sensitive receptors, that there are businesses which are have their uh, own major problems caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. So there are sensitivities uh, and the potential for further adverse impacts. However, officers view is that the likely degree of any increase in impact over what they uh, is currently ongoing at the site is not considered to be such that it would um, comprise those very compelling reasons and therefore um, um, officers consider the application should be approved. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, can I move straight on? We have quite a number of speakers on this particular application. Uh, and so could I um, could I invite um, Mr. John Ashley 
from the parish council, please. Mr. Ashley, could I ask you to um, to be as succinct as, as possible, um, so, so as um, proceedings can move as swiftly as possible? I'm not restricting you so that you can't get your point over, but just be mindful that it, it, it could stretch out this. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair, and I will be succinct. I do promise you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is John Ash. Um, I am the City of Durham Parish Councillor for Elbit and Giles Gate, which covers the whole of the city centre, including this site. And the Parish Council objected to the applications because of concerns of nearby residents and the applicants' generally poor approach to the issue. Um, condition 20 of the original approval in 2018 said, and I quote, no development works pursuant to the development hereby approved shall take place outside the hours of 7.30 a.m. till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday inclusive and 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. on a Saturday with no works on Sunday or bank holiday. End of quote. Toland have quite understandably now sought to use the government's temporary provisions, but assessing their wishes has been absurdly difficult and troubling for nearby residents by what I must say is the cack-handed way that Toland have gone about it. This is their third shot at saying what they want. The first obviously is in condition 20, which is allowing them 57.5 hours a week. But in June this year, they applied for 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday to Friday and 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. on a Saturday. They said the explanation for seeking this permission was in a covering letter, but unfortunately that was missing from the planning portal. And the missing letter also apparently said how Toland wished the condition to be varied. Again, it was impossible to know any detail of that variation. And the extended hours applied for in June, they would have meant working 83 hours every week until May 2021. So that's the parish council and local residents objection to the application as lacking essential information and failing to provide the safeguards needed to protect residential amenity. Toland then said that the reference to any, wor to any working until 9 p.m. on a Saturday was a mistake and working on Saturday was supposed to, to remain unchanged at a 1 p.m. finish. So that would have meant total would be reduced from 83 hours to 75 hours per week. But then having regard to further discussions with officers, a third amendment now proposes 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturday. So in a week where there would be five hours less working on a weekday evening, there would be five hours more on Saturday afternoons. And we are of course now in the dark winter evenings so getting five hours extra daylight working in exchange for five hours less evening working does make sense from Toland's point of view. But it is a sorry story of confusion and demonstrates how much better it would have been for Toland to have undertaken genuine liaison and consultation from the start. And the residential areas of Highgate, Diamond Terrace and Sidegate are located immediately adjacent to the Milton Gate House redevelopment site and they experience noise dust, disturbance from the site, and the level of noise has been described as intolerable. Indeed, the Parish Council has been asked by Sidegate Residents Association to point out that condition six of the 2018 planning permission requires a construction management plan to include, I quote, details of any planned measures for liaison with the local community and any procedures to deal with any complaints received, end of quote and Sidegate state that very little consultation has happened. There's been one site visit on 25th February, nothing since. There's been one newsletter in July announcing their intention to ext extend working hours. Sidegate say they have certainly received nothing from Toland, Toland about the current applications, only from the County Council. So the construction management plan containing those requirements for liaison with the local community has only just been approved in September 2020, two years after permission was granted on the basis that of that condition and long after construction started. This is poor practice, 
disrespectful to the planning authority and local residents and unworthy of a major company such as Toland. Parish Council considers that local residents have endured enough worry and disturbance and the application should be refused. Uh, thank you, Chair and Committee, for your courtesy in allowing me to address you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Ashby. Uh, Mr Jones, would you like to come in now or would you rather um, me, I pulled in the local councillor and answer both of them in one turn? Which, what's your preference? Uh, could, I, could, I, could I just come in briefly now? There's, there's, there's two reasons. I'll, I'll just answer a, a little bit of the, the commentary from, from John. I mean, the one point I'd like to focus on probably is the degree of confusion about exactly what was being applied for. and. And, and John's correct that there has been some confusion earlier on in the application as to exactly what degree of extension was being applied for. But I do think that that did very much get wrapped up um, clearly recently through a combination of um, a, a re-notification process undertaken by ourselves where we went out to local residents, um, clearly defining what the description of the development was. And then in conjunction, um, at a very similar time, Toland did do a, a newsletter. I don't exactly know how many uh, residents that went to. However, I did receive a copy of it and it stated the same hours as our notification did. So I do think that the confusion did get tidied up during the course of the application. Um, the second point I just wanted to come in on, Chair, is that and I meant to raise this uh, during my presentation, but didn't, is that I do just have a, a, a late, um, update to, to make on the suite of conditions. Um, it's just regarding condition 10 on the uh, proposed planning permission, which has the reference 20.0.13.32 VOC. Um, the currently drafted condition, uh, which relates to sound insulation for the operational phase of the development, it doesn't, in, uh, it doesn't take into account that there's actually a partial discharge of condition of this condition before. Um, so if the application is approved, I would require delegated authority just to tweak the wording of that condition, just to account that some of its requirements have actually previously been discharged. Uh, I just wanted to raise that now, Chair, before I forget. Thanks very much, Henry. Thank you. Can I now call on um, Mr David Freeman, who is the local member? David, over to you. Hello, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is uh, Councillor David Freeman. I'm County Councillor for the Elver and Gilesgate Ward of Durham County Council, and I'm also a member of um, City of Durham Parish Council as well. Um, I won't uh, go over again what my colleague Councillor Ashby's already explained about the history of this site and actually the, the poor way that um, Toland, the developers, have, have treated the local area. Um, so I will be actually quite brief. Um, I work actually for the Home Office, um, which is based in the Passport Office just over the river um, from this development. Um, throughout the period since the lockdown, building works have been ongoing daily. Um, I've seen it minute by minute as my desk faces this site. Um, and it'd be true to say that um, within the hours that um, the developers have at the moment, they've made extensive progress. Um, and we can see that from actually one of the slides that was shown on the evening. So um, I don't think the, the case there has shown that um, the lockdown has stopped them working on this site. And therefore, I think it does weaken the case um, for them having longer hours uh, going forward, which was the government's intention. The, the, the hours, to, the, the operating hours were to be extended for businesses that uh, developers, which, which have during the lockdown been um have have stopped them from um progressing on their site um for members i think um, the question is is this application for the variation of working hours uh, therefore fair and reasonable i have around 300 residents within 100 meters of this development site um, they've had to experience noise dirt and inconvenience um, and that's unfortunately to be expected um, during the working day. However, this development is looking to extend those hours, to extend the problems that residents have to experience into the evening, eight o'clock at night, and throughout Saturday up to six o'clock. 
I'm sure every, every member here would not be supportive of this um, extension of building hours if it was within their ward. And certainly as a member of uh, one of the area planning committees, it's not something that I would find favourable for any member in any ward within this county. Uh, I hope you'll therefore reject the extension of hours that are not fair to surrounding residents and not reasonable here or anyone else. Uh, you can reject this application on grounds of residential amenity, and I hope that you will do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Freeman. Um, Henry, would you like to come in on anything that Councillor Freeman has said, please? I don't think at this stage, Chair, no, no I'll wait to hear from, from others. That's fine. Thanks very much. Uh, so can we move on now? And I have uh, two um, uh, local residents who, who wish to speak, uh, uh, Mrs Grimes and uh, Mr D Dawson. Um, Mrs Grimes and Mr Dawson, you each have um, two and a half minutes. Um, I'm not sure who's going to speak first. Could you maybe advise me on that one? This is Mrs. Grimes. Sorry, Eileen, I'll let you go first. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, you have two and a half minutes, and when you have 30 minutes left, the um, committee clerk will uh, inform you of that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Here we are. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Here we are yes. again. Another variation in conditions for this Melbourne Gate development. Um, we understand this application is being sought as a result of the pandemic. Um, however, as, pe as everybody has said, it's already they've worked all through lockdown. Um, Arlington Developments and Torland have made press releases to say that they're making great progress on the site um, and that everything is going to go into schedule. Um, because of that, the working the working has continued. Um, this has been brought as a result of the ministerial guidance um, and ministerial guidance gives clear direction on that it can be refused on residential amenity. Your offices are attaching conditions. However, Torland have constantly breached the conditions that are in place at the moment. Um, and com those complaints have been logged with your offices. Are members confident that any conditions placed by on Torland, if this is approved, would be enforced and would be adhered to by Torland because residents don't have that confidence. Torland have provided little or no compelling evidence or reason for these extended hours and are purely trying to manipulate this guidance for their own agenda. The officer's report makes reference to this being a finely balanced decision and the objections are supported through the Durham County Plan, which you've all recently object, uh, approved, looking at visual intrusion, noise, loss of light, the increased light pollution during the dark mornings and evenings will be heightened by the floodlights and additional lights required for them, for them to work. There's been increased noise and dust from all aspects of work, which hasn't been monitored as per the condition of their permission, together with, together with loss. The most recent government guidance, everyone has now got to work at home where possible, and this will be increased and accentuated. In conclusion, ministerial guidance highlights in section seven reasons for refusal of extended hours where sites are within close proximity to residents. All the evidence given to committee today gives, us the gives you the opportunity to put the health, mental health and well-being of residents nearby this construction site above the construction company Time to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Grimes. And can I now uh, pass over to um, Mr. Dawson, please? Good morning, Michael Dawson from uh, Closegate Radisson Blue Hotel, where the direct neighbours to the construction site. Uh, firstly, I'd very much support the comments from Mr. Ashby and Mrs. Grimes, who have summed things up very well. I'd like to remind the committee that the work started on this site four years ago in November 2016. We would like to see the construction completed as quickly as possible because it's often not a pleasant environment in and around this locality. At Milburn Gate and now the Sands, there have been so many occasions 
when the site environmental monitoring has not been working or that the results provided after a particularly bad incident um, has occurred are provided months afterwards. Henry will verify this. Um, we've had conversations going back six months when we've been asking uh, for confirmation as to why an incident has occurred, because we are obliged to respond to our clients, our customers, our guests at the hotel within a very short period of time. They want to know why their cars are covered in dust. They want to know why they've been woken up in the middle of the night or very early in the morning. Um, I wonder if the, the committee knows that the construction management plan, which was referred to earlier, um, at the sand site has a condition which requires the developer to monitor only when they think necessary. So on the day when they were grinding steel all day and we had a stream of complaints coming through the door, complaint was made to the enforcement officer who went out and said, guess what, they weren't monitoring that day. Should the committee be minded to approve, which we hope they won't, then we would request that very strict environmental monitoring be put in place along the hotel boundary during the extended working hours, more strict than currently suggested, and that there be no permitted rights, such as the concrete plant, which went up on our boundary for most of last year under permitted development rights. There should be an obligation to cease working. There should be an obligation to cease working if early morning or nighttime noise limits in particular are breached. Hotel guests do not want to be woken up at seven o'clock in the morning by a reversing beeper, for example. We would request a planning condition whereby on-site physical monitoring for excessive noise, dust and vibration is conducted by a person during the extended working hours and that the results are provided to the council each and every day. Like I say, we hope this won't be necessary um, because we would expect the committee not to approve this. But that is a condition that's been um, put on one of our sister hotels in London, which is currently is undergoing. Year. Thank you, Mr. Dowson. Thank you very much. Henry, would you like to come and respond to, to those two speakers, please? The last two speakers? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't think I, I want to spend on each and every point. I mean, I think I think Michael, you know, he, he asked me to confirm a matter regarding uh, regarding monitoring. Um, there have been some issues with environmental monitoring in the past. Um, there, there, there have been um, our access to environmental monitoring now is better than it was. Uh, we actually have direct uh, access to um, look at the results of the monitoring now, which is something which haven't always had in the past. So in terms of delays of getting hold of information and things, we are in a better position now than we were before. Um, however, there have been some instances where uh, monitoring results uh, have have been missing, etc. Um, so that that has been the case. I think in terms of um, if there is an approval, Mr. Dowson, there were some specific requests put in there regarding um, uh, a number of items. Obviously, not not all of that would be covered by the current suite of conditions. So, if members do resolve to uh, approve the developments, but they would rather it would be with bolstered conditions, then we'd maybe need to have a conversation about that because not all of not all of the the conditions cover the request that Michael made there. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Um, can I now call upon uh, Mr. Rutherford for the for the developer, please? Mr. Rutherford, you will have five minutes and the uh, committee clerk will give you a warning when you have uh, one minute left. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning. <coughs> Thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. My name is Michael Rutherford. I'm the project director for Torland Construction uh, and the lead on the Milburn Gate project. The application has been made uh, in line with the government guidelines and the overriding principle of this application is simply to make the project safer uh, and to protect the health and safety of everybody employed on this site and by definition the health and safety of the local and wider community within Durham. 
The application has not been made with the intention of operating all the activities on the site throughout the extended period. It simply provides us with the flexibility to manage the construction activities and the logistical arrangements on the project, which creates valuable space and allows people and operations to, to, to be carried out in line with the government guidelines. As part of the application, we have provided a full and extensive schedule of operations, plant and machinery, which will not be carried out under any circumstances during these extended hours. Uh, and that will mean that there is no increase to noise levels at whatsoever throughout the project. There's been uh, various issues with regards to lighting. Uh, I would also confirm that all of the lighting on the site throughout the extended periods and obviously throughout going through the window, all of the lights are focused within the internal elements of the site. These lights will not in any way uh, be as on the same level as the lighting of the full operational scheme on completion. We have been very, very careful in the way that we have set up the lights and the majority of the works carried out within the extended hours will be within the body of the development, i.e. below the podium slab, throughout the service corridors and throughout the car park. None of these areas which are visible to the public. There's also been some issues with regards to or some potential objections with regards to the operational hours and the logistics with regards to deliveries. Again, we would argue by extending the operational hours, we can schedule out deliveries to avoid peak times, to avoid congestion, to avoid any particular increase in any aspect of the traffic in and around Durham City Centre. This simply gives us more flexibility to manage the operations. There has been consultation with the local residents. We would argue this up until the pandemic, we had held a number of open evenings where we invited all of the local residents to come into the site in which we could explain the project, where we were at with the project and the logistics and the constraints around it. Obviously, with the current restrictions, we have now suspended or postponed the uh, on-site open evenings and we've replaced these with consultation letters, which we have sent out. The latest one was sent out at the end of July, uh, giving various information with regards to the project. There has also been a number of, of, of discussions and issues with regards to the fact that we have continued working throughout the pandemic. And this is true, we have continued to work and that is by and through the dedication and planning of the site team. However, what I would say is that this has been at a significantly reduced rate to what was anticipated within the original programme. So yes, we haven't stopped operational on site, but the number and level and output of those operations is significantly reduced. And by extending these hours, we are not going to recover those costs, but we will mitigate further delays going on to the project. Uh, we would also say that the Durham County Council's nuisance team have carried out a risk assessment and they do not perceive that the extended hours would cause any nuisance uh, to the community. We'll close just by simply saying that the government guidelines at the minute with regards to the pandemic is hands, face and space. We can do hands and face on site and we can do space, but by allowing these extended hours, it gives us more flexibility to create more space from a logistical point of view in which we could separate the people on that on this project. And that has got to be a good thing in relation to the current pandemic. If you have any further questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them. Thank, thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Thank you. Uh, Henry, would you like to come in on any of, of what's been said, or, or are you happy just to uh, go along with it? I think I'm happy to hear uh, questions members have now, I think. Thanks very much, Henry. Thank you for that. C can I c call on... Um, 
uh, uh, Claire Cuskin, our legal uh, representative at this point, just to come in and uh, clarify some points, please. Chair, here. Yes. Yes. Uh, there's nothing from a legal perspective that that, uh, that I'd like to pick up that hasn't already been mentioned, Chair. Okay, that's fine. Thanks very much. And can I now call on um, Councillor uh, Clare, please? I believe that you want some clarification on something. Yes, I I, I do. Um, um, uh, I have a question of the applicant, and thank you, Chair, for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm just looking at paragraph 112 here, um, and uh, it's about the fifth bullet point down. It says key considerations for the local planning authority include, and the first one is the justification for the request. And um, I'd just like to explore that um, first with the applicant and then with the officer. Um, the first, and then my first question is therefore to the applicant. Um, how many weeks behind schedule have you fallen um, as a result of the pandemic? Sort of what I heard you saying, sir, um, was that um, it's going to allow you to um, uh, reduce the intensity of work moving forward. Um, Sort of, um, so that uh, I'm wanting to clarify, however, whether um, you've been able to maintain uh, the work to schedule during the pandemic so far. So that's the, my question to you, sir. How many weeks behind schedule are you on this development? And then to the officer, um, I'd like you, sir, to please, um, the, 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 there's a statement uh, throughout that the justification for the request is, in inverted commas, weak. And I'd like you to talk, Henry, to me about that weakness, which is mentioned a number of times throughout, um, and, and sort of, um, and just how weak is is that request in your opinion? So my first question, uh, thank you, Chair, for letting me witter on. The first question to the applicant, how many weeks behind? And then to um, Henry to come in and talk to me about the justification for the request. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Yes, with regards to the, the, the how far we are currently behind at the moment, there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dual approach in the sense that we do an assessment of where the project is at the moment, but we also do a forecast of where the project is likely to be under the set under the circumstances as we sit at the moment. So we do a full program review and we schedule out exactly how many and the level of resource that we have at every day, at every week throughout the entire project. Now at the moment we are currently running at about 30 to 35 percent from a productivity below what we had originally anticipated to do. Now, if you do a drop line on the program as we currently sit, we have reported to the client that we are 6.3 weeks late from the original date. However, the more important thing is that if we project the reduction in levels going forward, we are currently anticipating that the project will be 13 weeks late, current, based on the current output levels that we are able to do. Now, with regards to the output levels at the moment, the idea behind the extended hours is not necessarily that the operations will continue in full. We've been very specific in the operations that won't happen, but what, what couldn't really be perceived from uh, Mr. John's visuals at the beginning is that below this development, we have a huge amount of service corridors and service tunnels. Now we use these for distribution of materials. You can imagine the volume of this, the volume of materials that we have on site. Now to the local residents, to everybody else around the site, you cannot see those works until you are inside. There are various corridors, tunnels, service corridors. Now the idea being with the extended operation predominantly is that we will continue with the works as we would normally do throughout the normal day, the, the operational day. However, on the extended hours, we can use these hours to distribute the materials safely because we have a reduced number of people on site. Thank so, you, sir. You, you've answered my question. Um, you're now moving on to um, uh, other things to my question. Thank you very much indeed for that answer. No problem. 
Henry, would you like to come in now, please? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure what really gave the impression in the report that I said the justification was necessarily weak. Um, I, I didn't use the word weak anywhere or, or particularly look to get that across. So I, I don't know what's, uh, what in my report has really gotten that across because um, I, I, di I didn't really say that. I mean, I, I suppose that I would I probably agree that the justification perhaps is not as strong as if the site had had to close down entirely. Um, but equally, the all the, the written ministerial uh, statement and the accompanying guidance doesn't say that the purpose of this is wholly so that sites can play catch up if they had to shut down. It's to do with um, managing uh, all the kind of impacts that the pandemic might have and so that they do have more flexibility and and some of the things there that uh, Mr Rutherford was just just explaining so um, as I say I've never looked to get across that I think the justification is weak I would agree that it's probably weaker than than if the site had to shut down but I didn't I didn't use those terms in the report you're on mute John thank you Henry thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Clear. Uh, Councillor Atkinson. Sorry, Chair, my uh, my comments are for the the uh, members' debate. I maybe jumped the gun a bit. Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, Councillor Atkinson. Um, so, can I now open it up for for members for debate? Uh, is anyone who wishes to speak on that? Um, I'll take you now, Jim, if that's the case. <laughs> Yes, Chair, thanks very much. Um, I was looking at this application and last week I was in an um, economy and enterprise meeting, a uh, scrutiny committee meeting, and the thing that was very stark was what the virus, the virus effect is having on the economy. And there was a lot of it, a lot of uh, things going wrong, large amounts of money, things like that. And of course, one of the biggest problems is the social distancing. So I looked at this application and the one thing it can do, social distancing is, is the distance between two people. But if you can distance them by time, that gives us a little bit more of a chance. I mean, if you've got electricians, plumbers and carpenters and things all work, want to work in the same space at the same time, they might have to be close to each other. But if you can distance them by time, then you're giving yourself a little bit more scope to do something with the problem. Now, I'm... I'm hoping Mr Rutherford's good for his word. There's been some complaints that Tolens um, haven't been applying themselves properly and haven't been uh, have promised things in the past, the past and they haven't done it. I think the, the availability of extra hours, if used properly, and um, I have to say that Neil Matty Hammer didn't help Mr Rutherford on the noise thing. He could have timed that a bit better. <laughs> but um, as I say... If we can socially distance these trades, these different people at different times, they take notice of what all of the people are saying round about them. They're not happy with this. They're not happy with that. Mr Rutherford uh, can get the job going, get it done, get it finished, get it out of the way. And the extra hours, the extra hours should help with that. As I say, the economy isn't helped by the social distancing. If they use this time properly, if they take note of what everybody said round about them, then we should get the benefits of, of the extra time. So from there, I would be, yeah, I would be happy to propose this situation. Uh, but as long as we we monitoring it, they take notice of what they're being told and they use the hours properly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Atkinson. Councillor Shuttleworth. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I mean, we're in queer times at the minute, and I mean, I'm not against people working. But when, if, if this was in the middle of a field away from any houses, I would have no problem with this. But to start at seven o'clock, Monday to Friday, when it's dark nights, you're coming in, you're going out when it's dark, you're coming in when it's dark, I think it's really unreasonable to the residents of the city of Durham. And on that basis, I remove, remove refusal of the application. Thank you. Can, has anyone else, uh, any, any um, comments to make, please? Councillor Clare. This truly sir, is um, exactly what I was saying about the previous one, that people come to us um, mm -hmm. uh, making all kinds of promises about what they're going to do. 
and and we accept an application on the good faith of those promises um and um then those promises are not kept um uh, and that makes it very difficult for us um what strikes me is uh, what's come out clearly from this um, are two things. The first one is that Toland have just not taken sufficient care of their neighbours. And I was very, very strongly affected by um, the uh, testimony of the adjacent hotel. It must be impossible to run an effective hotel business with the things happening next door that are happening. And if we're talking about protecting the economy, we need to talk about protecting that hotel as well. Um, having said that, if this is going to, if this is running six weeks late already and is going to come in 13 weeks late, that is a quarter of a year. And there's two things about this. One, um, as Councillor Atkinson said, that's not good for the economy. And the second thing about it is, is that it will prolong the misery for the residents for another 13 weeks, another quarter of a year. And uh, sort of they, they sort of may avoid an intensification of um, the uh, work but at the extent, uh, at the, the cost of a prolonging of the work. Um, so that makes this such a difficult case. And I, I sort of, I do know <laughs> that Henry said that this is a very finely balanced case. Like if he didn't say that, Henry, come in and con uh, contradict me. But the fact is, it is incredibly finely balanced. Um, I, uh, so, um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to just say uh, one final thing, Chair, and that is um, if we're going to give permission to this, then the extent of monitoring and the extent of um, uh, planning enforcement that we're able to apply, that's clearly, in my opinion, been inadequate up to this present case. Planning enforcement has not enforced planning and monitoring has not allowed planning enforcement to do that to people to residents to neighboring residents satisfaction and sort of um, do we want to as a committee explore um, the proposal I'm so sorry I never remember names that but the gentleman from the adjacent hotel sort of do we want to explore as a committee his suggestion that if we're going to give um, planning permission for this, that we beef up the monitoring proposals um, and um, uh, sort of we couldn't do that chair um, uh, sort of discussing it as a committee. What we would have to do is just um, uh, give the uh, planning officers, perhaps with the chair, um, the uh, de devolved rights to um, uh, to uh, increase the monitoring. Um, sort of. Uh, so there's big problems about doing that, and it'll. I'm um, sorry, it'll extend the time we spent discussing it. But I really would like Henry initially, and perhaps Claire will have something to say. Um, uh, to talk to me about um, if I was to sort of do one of those things, improve, uh, uh, propose a condition on the grounds that I, I would not be prepared to um, uh, approve the um, proposal without um, that uh, that condition. Um, sort of, would it be possible to um, uh, create such? Uh, a, a toughened up condition or a new condition. Henry and Claire, could you could you speak to me about that, please? Um, it, I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. Um, there'd be different ways of doing it. We could potentially have a condition which requires a further form of construction management plan to be submitted and agreed. Um, 
there's positives and negatives to that. It would allow discussion on exactly the content of that. It would, it, however, these things can often um, be be difficult to 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 actually agree on, and they can cause delays in their own right. Alternative, I mean, I mean to 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 set out exactly what the monitoring currently comprises of at the moment. Right this minute, there is uh, an environmental monitoring device roughly in the centre of the site, and that monitors noise, vibration, uh, dust particulates of a certain size. And then on the boundary with the Radisson, there are uh, further um, sticky pad monitors, which specifically monitor dust of a, another type of particulate size. Um, potentially, you could say that the monitoring device, which is in the middle of the site, for example, we could demand that another one of those is located on the Radisson boundary so that there are, you know, two versions of that. We'd probably want now, we'd, we'd, you know, Michael would probably, Michael Rutherford would probably want to come in on how, um, you know, their willingness to, to agree to a condition like that, whether or not, you know, they would want this planning permission at all if it was subject to that condition. Um, so we probably need to get uh, some comment from him. But I mean, that is an example is something that we could potentially do. Thank you, Henry. Can I bring you in, Claire, now, please, before I, I ask uh, Michael Rutherford to, to come back? Yes. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, it, as Henry said, it certainly would be possible to impose a, an additional condition. Um, as Henry's outlined, there, there are potential difficulties in, in getting a, a form of word and agreed. So if that's something that members were, were minded to kind of go down that road, it, it would certainly be kind of preferable, I think, to have um, authority delegated to the, the team leader, perhaps in conjunction with the um, the, the chair or vice chair of the of the committee, just to try and agree those conditions. Because I, I don't think that's something we're necessarily going to be able to do satisfactorily here today in committee. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Mr. Rutherford, would, would you like to come in and um, I mean, what what are your, are your views on the suggestion? Uh, yes, we will. We will happily look at, at all the suggestions with that. Uh, as Mr. Jones has said, we've got a very, very sophisticated uh, environmental monitoring device on site at the moment that's located in the prime position on the site, and that's been agreed with the environmental control officers. We can look at putting additional ones of those in place. I would say, as a as a as a defence, I check those, and these are real time which the local authority can view at any point. It records constantly, and those are uploaded onto a, onto a, a CDE platform for anybody to view. I checked these before we came in, and we have not exceeded the uh, threshold levels for noise in probably about six months. Now, we can we can certainly look at putting more monitors up, and we're, we're happy to do that. Uh, and I can discuss that with, with Mr. Jones going forward. Thank you for that. Can Chair, I if I can come in at that point, um, sort of, <clears throat> this is really hard because there's lots of people listening who just want us to say no. Um, but, um, and I may not get a seconder, um, but I am there for sort of what strikes me is that what I've heard from the objectors is that um, actually their main beef was that Toland have not kept to the uh, conditions that were set and sort of the Radisson Hotel certainly put this down to a failure of monitoring and therefore um, I'm going to propose um, a condition um, uh, fairly much along uh, the lines uh, that Claire Cuskin suggested um, that um, the vice chair um, in association with the team leader should discuss with uh, Toland um, uh, sort of um, through the mechanisms that uh, Mr Jones suggested um, sort of an enhancement of uh, certainly the regularity and perhaps the, the degree of monitoring that goes on uh, so that um, uh, residents can be assured that the um, restrictions agreed to will be 
adhered to. So um, that's my proposal, Chair, um, sort of, uh, though I may not get um, a, uh, a seconder. Uh, thank you, Chair, for, for me allowing, allowing me to do that. That, that that's fine. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Councillor Clare. Now, uh, Councillor Richardson's been patiently waiting here to come in for quite some time now. So, can I pull in Councillor Richardson, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor George Richardson from Bannercastle East. I've listened with great interest to the debate, and I don't really need to add anything. But in this moment of time, I will second Councillor John Shuttleworth's. Uh, proposal for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Simon Wilson. Yeah, I haven't listened. Well, um, I think to be perfectly honest, I'd be quite happy to second uh, Councillor Clare's proposal. <laughs> Thanks very much, Councillor Wilson. Um, Councillor Alan Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I was just going to say it was to second um, Councillor Clare's because I, I also it's a really hard one, I think, for the, for the local residents. But I also think to add in a bolstered up condition also helps the like Durham County Council to to, you know, to address the current concerns. Because if we took if, we, if the application was refused, it then maybe it's allow on allow sort of, you know, the current current concerns to go to move on and not addressed. Um, but I really do hope that, you know, Tolland to take um, note of all of the members' concerns here, in particular the local residents and the local, you know, in, in particular the hotel. Um, you know, there's concerns all around and with the new bolstered conditions. I hope everybody becomes a good neighbours, as I would say. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Um, Councillor Atkinson, you, you made a, um, a, a proposal for acceptance. Now, your proposal and uh, Councillor Clare's seem uh, pretty similar. Um, what, w do yes, you still uh, want your initial proposal considered? Well, I was, yeah, I was, I was kind of hoping we'd take for granted that uh, Mr Rutherford would sort the job out. I, d I did mention that um, that he would take stock of the things that he'd heard this morning and 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 put the job right. If if Councillor Clare's is a more official way of going about it and and uh, makes it. I can't really tell whether it would make it any harder or any difficult, uh, any more difficult. Be, uh, there was a mention that there might be uh, discussions here and discussions there. I'm happy to go with uh, John's proposal uh, if that's a more official way to go about it. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Atkinson. Can, can I just sort of um, put my four penneth in here. Um, I, I've, I've listened to this sort of situation and um, what we're talking about by and large is the inconvenience to residents, local residents. And the thing is uh, whether we agree on this proposal or, or whether we disagree with the application, the inconvenience is not going to be taken away there's still going to be inconvenience. The difference is the timing of the inconvenience, whether it's early morning and later at night or whether it's longitudinal. So the project goes on longer. So I'd just like to, to keep that in, in mind. Uh, Claire, did, did you need to come in on that, that one, please, on anything there? Yes, thank you, Chair. So as I understand it, we have um, two proposals which have been seconded. We have a proposal by Councillor Shuttleworth, which was seconded first um, before Councillor Clare's proposal. I just wanted to check, Councillor Shuttleworth, your reasons for that proposal. Was it in relation to the unacceptable impacts on nearby the occupiers and businesses? It is, it is, it is Clare. It, it's you. totally Thank unreasonable. You. I know we're living in funny times, it's not right, but those people should not have to endure that because people won't just start at seven o'clock, they'll arrive at half past six. And it's unreasonable during the week, dark days, dark nights, that this goes on, This which was agreed what they were going to work when it was passed and it's unreasonable for the people of the city of Durham and those people around about the Radisson Hotel and them areas. Thank you. Chair, um, I, I don't have any further queries so I'm happy to proceed to the vote whenever you're ready. If right and I take it that we're taking um, Councillor Shuttleworth first? Yes Chair, so this Can we just reinforce what Councillor Shuttleworth's proposal is please? 
Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm just taking the vote now on the proposal to refuse the application to vary the conditions. So if I go through alphabetically, um, if you tell me whether you wish to refuse or approve. So if I start with Councillor Atkinson. Yeah, I'm against Councillor Shuttleworth's proposal. OK. Councillor Bell, are you for or against the proposal to refuse? Um, yeah, I'm um, for the proofs. Yes, yeah, so I'm against this one. Yes, yeah, you're against it. Yes, yeah. Councillor Clare. I'm against this proposal. Thank you, Councillor Jewell. I am against this proposal. Thank you, Councillor Kellett. Councillor Kellett, are you still present at the meeting? Yes, against. Against. Councillor Lang? Against. Thank you. Councillor Marshall? Against. Councillor Pounder? Against. Councillor Richardson? For refusal. Thank you. Councillor Shuttleworth? For. Thank you. Councillor Simpson? For. Thank you. And Councillor Wilson? Against. Thank you. Chair, make that um, nine Chair, three. Chair, could I just comment just for clarity for the minutes that I did enter the meeting? However, it was a few minutes after the officer started, so I won't be voting. It's Councillor Wilkes. I had some personal reasons why I couldn't enter the meeting earlier, but because I didn't hear the whole of what the officer said, I won't be voting. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Wilkes. OK, Claire, so um, that proposal has been unsuccessful. So can we now move on to um, Councillor Clare's proposal, please? And can you just clarify what that was, uh, can, uh, Clare, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes. So this is the proposal by Councillor Clare, seconded by Councillor Wilson, to approve the various applications subject to an additional condition regarding monitoring, etc., which is to be worked between the, the vice chair and the team leader of the, the strategic team. Um, if I go through alphabetically again, um, are you for or against the proposal, Councillor Atkinson? You're on mute, Councillor Atkinson. Sorry about that. Yes, I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Bell? For, I take it that's with the bolstered conditions on there. Yes, it is. Right. Yeah. Thank and you. Did, yeah. Um, Councillor Clare? For. Thank you. Councillor Jewell? For. Thank you. Councillor right. Kellett? For. Thank you. Councillor Lane? For. Thank you. Councillor Marshall? For. Councillor Pounder? For. Thank you. Councillor Richardson? Against. Thank you. Councillor Shuttleworth? Against. Councillor Simpson? Ag against. Thank you. And Councillor Wilson, finally? For. Thank you. Chair, that is 9-3 in favour of approval. I may agree on this. OK, so th this application for, for the conditions has been approved. That's fine. Thanks very much, everyone, for that. It's been a little bit long and drawn out, but um, we've got there in the end. Uh, can I can I just say to Mr Rutherford, um, when, when we're talking about uh, sort of the, the conditions, um, there, there has to be some goodwill there. Uh, I mean, I don't feel that monitoring on its own is the answer. It's adhering to um, what the, the monitors tell us um, and, and do our best for the local community. Thanks very much. So Thank can, you very I, can much. we now... Can we now call in um, the the chair, please, uh, Councillor? Thank you very much, Councillor Jewell. And you will you will still speak to me after being given that in short notice, won't you? Yeah, I certainly will. So there is no items on item six or item seven. So can we thank our IT colleagues, Mr. Ian Croft, our solicitor Claire Cruskin, Chris Shields, Henry Jones, and Andrew Dinch from the, um, the planning department who presents today and now substitute members who've t uh, arrived. Um, that is the end of the meeting. Could I please ask members to remain silent and